Hello everybody, my name is Liam Smiraglia. This is part one of a three-part lecture series on AlphaGo and how AlphaGo uses Monte Carlo tree search and deep learning networks to solve the artificial intelligence problem of mastering the board game Go. Uh, this part, we are going to focus on the basics of Monte Carlo tree search. So to understand Monte Carlo tree search, we have to understand the class of search problems we're looking at. Uninformed search runs without domain specific knowledge. So we don't have insight into how the game is played necessarily, what strategies might be effective. Uh, all we really know is the game state that we're at. An example of a game state for tic-tac-toe on the right would be the board and whose turn it is. We know whether that game state is terminal, meaning that the game is over. Uh, we know what actions we can legally take from that state, and we know what state those actions lead to. And that's enough information to construct a game tree. An example of the game tree is there on the right with tic-tac-toe. Uh, the board states are, are the nodes, and then we have edges, which represent actions pointing to other game states. So there are many different algorithms that can be used to search game trees like this. Two very simple examples are breadth-first search and depth-first search. Uh, and I'm not going to go into detail about these. You can look them up if you want more information. But the relevant part for this presentation is that these algorithms both run in exponential time. Uh, they run in O of B to the D time, where B is the branching factor, uh, which is basically the average uh, number of legal actions that you can take at a given state. And D is the depth, uh, which is the average number of moves in a game. Uh, and this might be fine for a game like Tic-Tac-Toe, where there's not many possible game states, not many actions, uh, but this quickly becomes intractable and impossible to navigate for, for games with large state spaces like Chess and Go. Um, we have a table on the bottom right here. Uh, even with Chess, uh, B to the D is starting to get very, very large, and when it comes to Go with a branching factor of 250, uh, it's going to be impossible to even think about how big that number is. It's more than the number of atoms in the universe. So a search like breadth first search and depth first search is just not possible in a game like Go. These algorithms, breadth first search and depth first search, they're not viable for games with large state spaces because they rely on brute force to search for a goal. Uh, so say, for example, that we're searching for a terminal state where we win. Uh, depth first search and breadth first search would look through every state in the space until they find one where we win. Every legal move is explored regardless of whether or not it's a good move, and good play and bad play are treated with the same curiosity. Uh, so there's an intuition there that we should be able to reduce our effective state space, reduce how many states we're actually going to explore, and be able to save some time if we can identify what moves are promising and focus our exploration on them. Uh, so one algorithm that tries to capitalize on this intuition is Monte Carlo tree search. So the basis of Monte Carlo tree search is a series of four steps that we repeat over and over again to grow the search tree towards the most promising moves. Uh, and you can see that in the picture on the bottom right. Uh, there's selection where the tree is traversed until leaf nodes found and selected. Then one or more moves from that state are chosen and the tree is expanded. A game is randomly simulated from that action, and that result is used to update the tree. Uh, so to talk about the search tree itself, it consists of nodes that represent game states. And each of these nodes have information. Uh, they have two things in them, two variables. One is the number of times that the node has been selected. We could call that the visit count. And the other is the average value of that state across its simulations. The first step of this four-step loop is selection. Uh, in selection, we recursively navigate our search tree and we select child nodes until eventually we reach a leaf node. Um, and we do that according to an algorithm. And what makes an algorithm good for selection is that it balances exploration and exploitation, which is a concept you'll see a lot in artificial intelligence. Exploitation is about selecting the most promising move, that intuition we talked about earlier, where we think a move is promising, so we're gonna follow it because we think it's more valuable to look there than somewhere else. Exploration, on the other hand, it's gonna try less promising moves that we might need to further explore some more uh, because maybe our evaluation's wrong, especially if we haven't visited a node uh, a large number of times. And we have an example of one selection algorithm in the bottom left. It's an argmax, so we're going to try this, uh, this equation for each child node and 
whichever node um, returns the highest value, that's the one we select as we recursively navigate this tree. Uh, so if we break this equation down, uh, first we have VI, that first part, that's the exploitation term, that's that average value of that child node, which we talked about earlier as one of the two things we store. And then that second term is the exploration term. Uh, and we can see that that depends on NP, which is the visit count of the parent, and that's divided by NI, which is the visit count of the child. Uh, so if there's a situation where the node's parent has been visited a large number of times, but this child hasn't really been visited a lot, then that exploration term is gonna be higher. Uh, and we multiply that by a constant C that allows us to tune that exploration and exploitation balance. So we've done selection, we navigate through this tree, we eventually reach a leaf node. The next step is expansion, where we select a move from the set of legal actions that we can take. Uh, we can do that randomly or with a policy, and then we add that state that that leads to into our search tree. Uh, so we think about the two pieces of information that every node in the search tree has. A visit count, that's easy. For this new node, we just set that to one. Uh, and then there's value, which is more complicated because we have to estimate this value and we can't just look through the entire tree because like we've said, the state spaces on some of these games are intractable. Uh, so what Monte Carlo Tree Search does is it does a Monte Carlo simulation. So it rolls out, it plays the entirety of the game from this new node state all the way to a terminal state. Uh, and it picks the moves randomly or pseudo randomly if there's a, a simulation strategy. And so eventually we get to a, a terminal state and there's a value based on whether we win, whether we lose. Uh, with the tic-tac-toe example, I think it was one if X won, zero if we tied, uh, negative one if O won. Uh, so then that is what we'd initialize that new node's value as. Uh, and these, these simulations are how Monte Carlo Tree Search chooses to uh, address this. Other algorithms like Minimax might use a heuristic to estimate the, um, the value from a given board state, but for some games, it's difficult to calculate a good heuristic. Uh, and that simulation strategy, we talked about we can do it randomly or pseudo-randomly. If you have a good simulation strategy, it definitely goes a long way for performance of Monte Carlo tree search, but you have to balance that against uh, something that's too deterministic because if it's too deterministic it's going to do the same thing every time and you're not going to get the full depth of possible moves uh, and then there's also the fact that you don't want something that takes too much time to roll out you want the simulations to be very quick not computationally expensive so you can do a lot of them so we've done our Monte Carlo simulation we get a result our last step here is back propagation uh, and backpropagation is how we update uh, this information for each node, the visit count and the average value, not just for the, the leaf node or new node, but for every node on that path. Uh, so say for example, we do a, a tic-tac-toe simulation, we get to the end, X wins, we get a result of one. After we get that, we trace back the path that we took in selection and for each node on that path, we're going to increase the number of visits by one. And then we're also going to update our average value to take into account this new value that we have. So this kind of ensures that uh, every single node has that visit count. Uh, it's the correct number. And every average value is really the average value of every child node in its subtree. So if you look at the, uh, the picture in the bottom right, uh, like that top node, its value is the average value of every single child node that it has. When we put those four steps together and we repeat that loop over and over again, it creates that search tree that grows in the direction of promising moves and that records the value of, uh, of each of these moves, of each of these states. Um, so I have an example of pseudocode on the right here. Uh, in practice, the way Monte Carlo Tree Search would be used is that you would call it on a single node, uh, like the state that you're at in the game, uh, and then it would create this tree. It would run this loop over and over and over again. Uh, you can see selection. It recursively searches through that tree until we hit a, uh, 
so we hit a node outside of the search tree or, or the leaf node there uh, then it does expansion simulation back propagation updates those values it gets to the end and as you can see return best move is the argmax of the visit count so it looks at uh, that first root node that we called Monte Carlo tree search on it looks at all of its children and it looks at all of their visit counts uh, and you might expect it to be the value that it would look at but it's actually the visit count uh, because it's less prone to outliers and it still represents that same thing because if a, if a node is getting visited that many times especially one in that first level it means that it's a very promising move and that its children are also very promising uh, so we return that and that's the move that we take uh, and in a lot of situations where you're using Monte Carlo tree search you're probably going to call this again on that node that we just returned uh, so a little trick that you can do to save some time uh, is to cache all of the uh, all of the nodes all the information underneath that child node that you selected and use that to sort of bootstrap your next call of Monte Carlo tree search and uh, on the slides it says a certain number of iterations it, that loop runs uh, in practice it's realistically more like the amount of time for example like if if it's a algorithm playing chess uh, you might have like we want to you might say we want to make a move in 10 seconds because it's a timed game so you do as many iterations as you can in that time because uh, the more iterations you do the more accurate uh, your tree is going to be as you can delve deeper into that state space these are my sources i'm going to link these in the description of the video uh, thank you for watching hopefully you check in for the second video we're going to be talking about how monte carlo tree search was adapted for alphago